afternoon and welcome to a very windy, very gusty Juma game reserve. My name is Tristan Dixon. On camera today I've got VM the Wildebeest. There is VM. And it is a very windy afternoon. It's going to be an interesting afternoon to see what the animals get up to in wind like this. It also probably means that there is a bit of a change in weather on its way. Now, this is a live interactive safari, so we love to hear from all of you. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat if you want to get involved. Now we have this little moth, this poor moth that has landed on my steering wheel and I'm going to take my hands away. I've been trying to put my hands there to cup it so that it didn't get too much wind because I wanted it to still be here when we started and it is the most incredible looking moth. You can see it looks like a little bit of wood and almost like a little wood shaving. You can see it's got the bark on the edge and then that lighter coloration and if this moth was on a piece of bark that had a little bit of kind of bark torn off it would be seriously difficult to see this thing. It would be in camouflage incredibly well and it is the first time I've ever seen a moth that looks like this. So I've never seen this before. And Jared, our tech genius, found it. You can see the poor thing is being blown about all over the place at the moment. And that's being quite protected on my steering wheel. It's much windier if I had to turn the steering wheel a little bit. But what interests me about this whole thing is if you look on the front here, close to the, the face area, you'll see there's these kind of two big bulbs around the head. Now they almost look like false eyes. It's almost as if to give an impression that this insect has got much bigger eyes than it actually has. The eyes are actually in front here where the gray sort of section is just in the top front portion. And those eyes are actually very, very small. But these big bulbs here almost give it the impression that it's got big eyes that it's able to watch what's going on. It's really cool to see. And it's not every day you get to see something as camouflaged and is perfectly sort of suited to its environment as this. Now unfortunately this poor fella is going to get blown away at some point. I can't leave him on my steering wheel so I'm trying to get him to a situation where he gets a bit of protection and can have it nice and easy until the night sets in. But while I try to figure out how I'm going to get rid of him and where I'm going to put it, let's send you across to Ali so she can say good afternoon to all of you. Sorry, it seems like the wind is about to blow our cap, our roof, and everything else off. <laughs> My name is Ali, and on camera with me today is Ferg, and we are fighting and braving the African weather just to be able to go and find some animals. Now, if you've got any comments or any questions, please send them through using the hashtag Safari Live or use the YouTube chat. We are not too sure where we're headed. We want to go perhaps see the last area where the tracks were in, in this morning for a pack of wild dogs, see if perhaps by any miracle they've come back and I think that's our plan for the afternoon. Other than that perhaps we'll head later on to see good old boy Tingana, the male leopard. Hopefully we'll, he will be roughly in the same area where we saw him this morning and we'll be able to share some time with him. Now I'm hoping that will be the case and other than that like I said just braving the wind. We were scheduled to do a walk this afternoon but it is the windy conditions often make it very dangerous so we've decided against it just because of our general safety. Now as you can see the wind all around us is if you look at all the grass you can see how everything's moving all the trees all the branches now the weather has been quite puzzling and we had this massive storm predicted for today, lots and lots of rain, but as the day has gone through we still haven't had any drops, which is a good and a bad thing, so I wonder if perhaps later uh, on during this afternoon we're going to get all that rain. It'll be interesting to see. Although we are ready for the rain, Ferg and I, we've got all of our rain gear, so we're not scared. We will brave the weather as, <laughs> as well as the Impala, I hope. They were being very clever and we just went past one breeding herd and they were all tucked away in the bushes, all standing together, trying to seek or find some shelter from all this, all this wind and the possible gloomy weather ahead. Now, there is a blue sky to our right, so towards the east, so I am hoping that the beautiful blue skies are going to carry with us for the rest of the afternoon and I think we are actually going to start driving onto the blue skies. That sounds like a wonderful plan for the afternoon. We'll just pretend and go and <laughs> leave the dark skies ahead of us behind us so that way we won't even see them. Right, seems like Tristan is looking up at some tracks so let's head back to him and find out what he's after. 
I am looking at tracks. I'm looking at tracks of probably one of the biggest snake tracks that I've seen since I've been at Juma. This is seriously large. As you can see it, it's kind of twi twizzling its way. I don't know what the word would be, sort of going from side to side across the road. You can see the big mounds of um, sand being pushed away from the backside and going so the, the snake was moving towards us with the sand being pushed away from us a little bit and so what I want to show you is just how thick this snake track actually is it looks about the size of my forearm so where's a good clear one here Vim let's do this side so if I have to put my forearm inside there there we go it fits just right so my forearm would fit inside of that section right there which is well, there we go. That's how wide that snake is. That gives you an idea of how thick this snake is and how big it is. Now, snakes that get this thick are very few and far between. There's only probably three candidates that we could take for this. One would be a puff adder. The other one would be a python of some size. I mean, that wouldn't be the biggest python, but it would be a python. Or a incredibly large black mamba would be the other option. But given the small gait of the twist and turn, it probably in all likelihood is a very big puff adder. Puff adders get a wide, wide, wide body. And that small kind of gait like that would be a short snake, but very wide. But still amazing to see. Now, it's gone towards a little section here behind me that's fallen over trees and stumps. And and these tracks are actually funny enough on top of our vehicle tracks where we came down just now which was not long ago maybe about 45 minutes ago so I want to just check back here and see maybe we get lucky and we can actually find the snake and track it down probably went in somewhere here lots of little snake hidey holes here there's a little termite mound that it could have gone in So, Captain Awesome, you say, please go look for the snake. Well, I mean, we can try and track it down. Of course, it's going to go to a certain point, and I think it's probably going to hide away. If it's something like a python, then they go underground quite a lot. So, they'll find a termite mound into the termite mound and hide out. Something like a mamba is going to be very quick and move off up into the trees and going to be quite tough to find. Puffhead is probably our best bet in terms of actually finding the snake. We'd have to walk through this grass and look very, very carefully and try and see if I can spot it somewhere here. But they also will get in under things and get into a place where they can hide. You might find because of this temperature change that we're getting and this wind that's blowing, maybe the snake is on the move and just trying to find a better more sheltered area in order to spend the day but I'll try and follow the track now and just see where it goes and, and try and work out exactly the point that it disappears if I can follow the track I should be able to work it out and see if it's gone into the ground or something like that if it's gone into a mound obviously I'm not going to be putting my hands down there or doing anything like that and I don't really want to get a surprise from a mamba or a puff adder thank you very much they are not very pleasant snakes to deal with sometimes so I'm going to try and just have a little look around see if I can find it for you and see if we can get some sort of semblance of view of the snake the problem with that is that I'm going to need to track it Kirsty so I'm not going to be able to do that while I'm live because I'll have to follow it via my feet and that means that I'm not going to be able to really talk to you guys or see what you see so I'll have to just try and reverse a little bit first and see what I can see with the camera ah so We've got no signal with Byron, and Ali's got low signal, so you're all stuck with me. So I'm going to have to do this with a vehicle. Let's see if I can manage this with a car. This should be quite interesting. Okay, there's lots of little hidey holes here. Vim, did you see exactly where that's crossed? And I'm trying to look if I can see the snake track on the ground itself. We obviously don't want a situation. So it came along there. And it came straight to where VM is saying, just on my left hand side. I wonder if it didn't go into this little termite mound here. There's a little hole that is straight down. Let's have a little look. Oh, that's rather deep. There's a massive, massive hole that is down here. I can't see anything inside there, but it looks as though that's where that snake went, is towards that little termite mound. So I wonder if it hasn't gone deep inside there, maybe just to get out of the wind a little bit and out of this cold weather. Inside there will be a lot warmer than what it is out here. This cold wind has come, and so for a snake, going inside there is going to be like a little oven and keep them nice and warm. And if you're a cold-blooded animal, warmth is what you want. That keeps you active and able to then hunt and find food. So I think that's where it's gone. I just want to do a little loop around the bush on the left or the southern side and see if I can see anything. 
Obviously, you also don't want to drive over the snake. Of course, the snake will move. It's not going to stay still, but... But like I say, the track is very, very fresh. It's from 45 minutes ago at maybe even later. That's just the kind of time frame we've got to work with. So, I mean, if that was a leopard track, that would be as fresh as you could possibly ask for and you'd bet your bottom dollar you'd find it. But a snake is a completely different story. Looks like Yuri might have some company if it's continued all the way through. Mm, going to be very tough to find it in this. I don't think, unfortunately, we're going to get this right. With that termite mound there, I think it's gone straight down inside. I mean, there's no sign of it anywhere where I can see in these trees, and we should be able to spot it quite quickly if it was like that. So, unfortunately, we're going to have to abandon that search for now and brave the winds of Juma. Tanis, in terms of tracking the hardest things to track, I mean, it depends on what we're talking about. You know, you've got species like um, the big animals, which undoubtedly the hardest big animal to track is leopard by far. Uh, it's why when you do your tracking assessments, leopard is the one that you follow in order to become the highest level of tracker that you can be. So you have to find the footprint of a leopard and follow it and try and find that animal. So in terms of big animals, I would say them. Um, in terms of smaller animals, well, I mean, there's a lot of different ones. There's things like wasps that collect mud or um, spiders or um, crickets, scorpions. Uh, those are minute little tracks. And because they don't really leave big sort of traces on ground, other than them crossing roads or pathways, it's almost impossible to follow their tracks. So I find those very tough. Um, what else is a difficult animal to track? Things that move very fast and very far. So wild dogs are tough to track. Um, hyenas, funny enough, are, are not easy either, and that's also because of the amount of hyenas out here. There's often crisscrossing of tracks, which makes it very difficult. Um, what else? That's about it. The rest of the big animals, elephants, buffalo, rhinos, um, they're fairly simple in terms of the tracking process. They leave big signs for you, and the nice thing with them is that they leave very large um, areas where they've fed, so it's not only their footprints, but it's also where they've fed in broken branches, pulled up grass, and those kind of things. Now, VM has spotted a little surprise in the grass there, so it's very well camouflaged, but there's a little scrub here that's come out quite early, and uh, probably because the clouds are out, and it's a bit dingy already this afternoon, and so a perfect time for a scrub head just to come out and nibble but you can see nocturnal and why they are so successful at being nocturnal look at the size of the eyes and the ears in relation to their body massive 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 eyes big ears that allow them to hear and see what's going on even in the dark of night and so they can thrive in that way they've also got a very sensitive nose that picks up a lot of scent but this poor animal will probably be as petrified as it looks it looks very wide-eyed at the moment and that's because of all of this wind it's not going to be an easy night for any of the prey animals when it's windy like this the the predators have an absolute field day and they can get stuck into all of these prey animals and it makes it much harder for the prey animals to be sort of find out where the predators are wind swirls noise and those kind of things but did you see how well it camouflages it's amazing that the camouflage that these little guys have good little scrub here stay safe be careful i saw a martial eagle flying around here earlier so scrub here is in danger from martial eagles i must be a little careful of them seems a little quieter today around there doesn't seem to be all the ellies and i'm not surprised elephants hate wind and so when the wind kicks up like this the ellies are into the thickets as quick as possible just to get out of the breeze that's blowing and they try and kind of stay as sheltered and as protected as possible so i'm not surprised we're not seeing too many elephants around vim for the, for the afternoon we're going to try find tandy Vim and I are going to try and find Tandi, that's what we're going to go and do. So we're going to set out into the eastern, southeastern beyond and try and see if we can find this leopard and where she's been hiding. And while we do that, it sounds as though Byron Tardy Sarau has got his speedos sorted out, he's tucked his shirt in, he's all sorted and is now ready to finally join us for the afternoon's drive. Oh, that's not very fair, Trist. I, um, I, I do apologize for being late, uh, but good afternoon. My name is Byron, and on camera with me is Senzo. And 
what a good start. I found a big bull elephant. Now this one looks rather large. So let's go and have a look. It's very, very windy. I know Tristan has been telling you about it, but wow, it's amazing how the weather has changed. The wind's actually blowing from that elephant to us. Wow, this is a big bull. I'm going to have a good look at this male and see his reaction to the vehicle. Wonderful. Now this is a great start for me. You all know how much I enjoy spending time with these big elephant. Seems very relaxed. Now I wonder if this isn't the uh, that elephant that's got a hole in his ear. Can you see a hole in his ear there, Senzo? No, on his right ear. Let's see, sorry, the other one. Uh, it's just not turning enough. I don't see a hole. No. No, so it's not the elephant that um, Taylor knows as Daryl. But he is a large male, enjoying the fruit at the moment. So many fruit here. Now, I'm just going to sit still and see if this male decides to come a bit closer to us. It could be, could be really entertaining. Now, I'm sure I saw this male the other day because he's got a prominent hole in his left ear, a small little one, and he looks. Uh, and he looks, uh, he looks similar. I'm not sure though. There are a lot of elephants that uh, come through this area. Bobby, I'm not sure. The largest elephant I've seen. Um, I did see one or two really old bulls on Londolozi a few years ago. Passing through and, and some, some bulls. There's one male, really, really old male. That had these massive tusks. And they almost touched the ground when he walked. And that was magnificent to see. I saw that once. Um, but I, I've definitely seen bulls a bit bigger than this. Okay, I'm going to sit quietly. Let's see what this male does. Is he going to come closer? I'm sure he's enjoying this cool breeze at the moment. He's not showing any signs of aggression. Seems very relaxed. I, I must be honest, I really do feel privileged when we get to sit with, with these magnificent beasts. To think this elephant is probably 30 or f maybe even closer to 40 years old. It's quite a large male. I bet you he's got some amazing stories growing up in the Greater Kruger. Now my plan this afternoon is actually to go to those lions, the Inkuhuma Pride. Um, I'd like to try and get there fairly soon because it is quite cool. Maybe we're lucky and they start moving around. Apparently Tristan said they looked quite hungry this morning. So, um, so who knows? Perhaps those lions decide to get up and move. I think uh, we'll leave this magnificent bull. Wonderful start for us. Very happy we got to see it. I saw that snake track that Tristan was looking at. That was that was amazing. I wonder, I wonder where that snake disappeared to because that was a really large track. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go and look for those lines. Let's go to Ali who's heading down to Chitwa. We are and. We're taking a bit of a detour. We've decided to take the northern boundary and then go down to Takatla and just to see what's been happening around here. Obviously all in the hopes of fi finding Tamba, perhaps somewhere perched up on a marula tree. Although chances of any leopard being on top of a marula tree today are 
I would say a little bit slim just because it is so windy. So if it's very windy at our vehicle level, I would imagine that on top of a marula it's even worse. So likely they're all going to be doing the same thing as Tingano is doing today. And they're going to be down on the ground, probably hidden, tucked away in the bushes while they stock something or while they carry on with their afternoon nap. Now we haven't really seen all that much up here and we couldn't even pick up tracks for Tamba so I think he's probably still somewhere in Bofosuk probably trying his luck. He was hunting yesterday so I am hoping he managed to get something perhaps a diker or a siembok that would have st still been a good meal for him. Now there's always the hope that they, all of the leopards are going to catch something bigger this afternoon because it is very windy and it seems like this type of weather condition is normally favorable for the predators to catch something. So we'll see. I think maybe tomorrow morning or the day after that's when we'll really be able to see what's been happening um, after the night because that's when they're going to have the premium advantage all of these beautiful years. I think we're going to go past what's happening there. You never know what might be coming down to the water. And the last time we went there, which was hippos, which was there's a normal good old friend and the other one who I don't know who it is. While we get to Buff Dam, though, we're going to head back to Byron. I believe he's on the lion search. Um, I am on, indeed on the lion search. Now, let's see, I think they were around here somewhere. Senza, let's keep our eyes peeled. Now, again, this weather is tricky because they may have already got up and started moving, which would make it a bit harder for us to find them. So we, I'm just going to scan very, very carefully as we go through here. I think they were around here this morning. Let's try to have a look. Obviously, a lot of vehicles have driven through here already in the course of the day. So it would be difficult to find fresh tracks of them heading this way. But maybe, maybe. If they've started to move, we might find fresh tracks of them moving this afternoon. I don't think our birding is going to be very good this afternoon. Generally, when it's very, very windy like this, then the birding is not great. Trying to have a look and see if I can find any sign of these lions. Anything yet, Senzo? All right. I think Tristan mentioned something that they were near the old hyena den, which is which is right at line. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's have a quick look and see what the pride is up to. I see a few heads up already. Oh, this is great. Well, that is wonderful. Oh, yep, a couple of heads up. And then some lying down, not moving. Oh, wonderful. Looks like the whole pride is here. Can just see some of them are behind some trees. I don't think you'll you'll see them. But this is much better weather uh, for potential movement compared to yesterday afternoon when we were sitting with that Styx pride, the other pride of lions. Remember how how hot it was yesterday afternoon, and um, and those lions hardly moved. They moved out of the drainage line where they were, or that that dry riverbed, and went and lay on the bank and just carried on sleeping. It was so hot. And I think they probably only got active much later. Now, there's a very cool breeze. And also, with it being so windy, these might be good conditions for these lions to hunt. So possibly, if we're lucky, we're going to be patient. We're going to sit with these lions. Maybe we get them getting up, moving around, and possibly trying to hunt a bit later but for now they are resting so we're gonna sit tight 
Let's go across to Ali, who's apparently heading towards the dam. Well, we are, and we have arrived onto Bufosuk Dam, and much to our surprise, there's not one hippo, but three of them. Now, they, I'm not too sure which one is our good old friend that's normally in here. I am slightly tempted to say that it's not the one that is standing on top of the water, just because I can't seem to remember that discoloration behind its ear. Perhaps I just haven't noticed. Perhaps this is the same one, but it's quite interesting to see that there are two more around here. Uh, what... It could be as perhaps the two young bulls have come into this particular um, water hole looking for a place to, to conquer <laughs> a new area. Maybe they've come all the way from Chito Dam. Maybe they've come from one of the dams on Buffalsuk. There are quite a few um, dams all around us and it wouldn't be surprising if they started moving in this weather just looking for new places. Now there has been a little bit of display involved the big bull that's in there has been opening his mouth there's been a little bit of defecating and spraying of their dung which is normally all done on a show of <laughs> type of thing just to advertise that he is the big one and he is the owner of this particular area now the little bird behind it is a little green which <laughs> obviously now decided to try and fly against the wind which is not working too well for it and then we've got this three very puzzling. I'm hoping that they're going to do something as they were a little bit more active a few moments ago. So we're going to stand still and just see if perhaps they get up to what they were doing earlier on. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if these guys only arrived today because yesterday afternoon, I mean, Byron and I were here and there were definitely only two of them in there. So there's a newcomer and perhaps that's what's throwing a bit of a spanner in the works and altering them. First lady, yes, hippo do mate underwater and their calves are also able to suckle underwater, which is quite interesting uh, of, in terms of all the things that hippos can do underneath the water. But yes, um, they do it under the water. I'm not too sure if these guys are even interested in that. And I think that middle one, I, I want to say that he's a new one and he's a much older bull in comparison to the other two that we're seeing here. I'm assuming they are bulls because they don't have little ones attached to them. But, um, I don't know, seems like, seems odd, seems like new things are, are starting to change with this wind. Are you going to tell them who's the boss? Definitely approaching one of the youngsters. A little bit of tension going on there, gone all the way down in the water. Okay. It's a bit of submissive behavior. Normally when animals make themselves either look smaller or when they put their heads down, it's a way of admitting almost their defeat in terms of, of territorial, of hierarchy, of dominance, as in a way of saying, fine, I know you're the boss, let's be in peace, you're in command. So I think perhaps that's we, what we just witnessed. There's one to the left, a little bit smaller than the one on the right, just putting his head down and being like, fine, you, you are the boss, just we're fine, don't worry about it. Now, I was hoping that he was going to come out and open his mouth and show his big tusks to us, but it doesn't seem like he wants to do it just yet. Tail, I'm not sure if hippos ever drown. Perhaps if they can, if in very big currents, if they cannot get to, to the surface and get air on them, I'm pretty sure that would cause them to drown. It's part of the reason also why they seem to prefer areas where the current is very slow and normally if there's a pod with babies, they either prefer lakes or air, rocky areas, but you'll never find them in a, in a river that's flowing all too quickly, probably because if they cannot fight the current to try and get to the surface to get air, yes, they could potentially drown. Although in this particular case, I'm pretty sure that they're standing or lying. I don't think Bufosu Dam is that deep. I think it has gotten surface otherwise they wouldn't be able to have as much of their body exposed and out and about hmm. seems like Tristan has found a creature that is perhaps just as pretty as a hippo so let's head over and see well I think it's a fair contest between the two of them so hippo versus warthog although I feel like I would give hippo a cuter factor than a warthog, especially I suppose maybe baby warthogs aren't too bad, but these guys, these big male warthogs, are not the prettiest things in the world. You can see they've got 
big big warts on them which is how, well, how i know that they're both boys as well as well you can see the male testes underneath the tail of the one facing away from us and the one on the far side is a little skittish the one closest to us is not too bad it doesn't worry about us too much but you can see that one's keeping a beady eye on us and is covered in ox peckers at the moment both of them and so these guys i'm sure are getting quite a bit of food and off go the warthogs trotting away everything's going to be a little bit like this i think everything's going to be a bit shy a bit reclusive when the wind is howling the way that it is this afternoon most of our prey animals are going to be a little worried about predators and therefore going to be a lot more shy than they normally are so it'll be i think a day like this where we're going to get brief views of our antelope species before they trot off and try and get away from where we're sitting in case there is a predator around. Now we've just driven a sneaky little route along the Mulawati all the way from just south of the dam wall and then down towards Chelapan just in the hope that we'd maybe pick up some sign of Tandi moving around in the Mulawati maybe she's kind of moved back into this section and just keeping a low profile but nothing there's not a single track for a female leopard inside there that I picked up and we looked quite nicely and we checked all the spots that she's used before with this cub there's no sign of her visiting any of those areas so she's not this side she must be further to the east and I think maybe she's spending a bit more time on Torchwood than we actually realize at the moment so I'm gonna just kind of check Trias Dam quickly down to Twin Dams and then we're gonna really work the eastern side quite heavily for ton, any sign of Tandy. So we'll drive around, we'll try and listen out for some alarm calls. I'm hoping because it's overcast like this that if she is around that she's up and moving or maybe she's hoisted a kill or something if the conditions from last night were suitable for hunting. I'm pretty sure Tandy would have taken advantage of it. So we'll go and check around there and just have a little look and see what's going on. So that's the idea anyway hopefully it will work out and we will find her somewhere in this area with the little cub it's been so long since I've seen that little cub I'm pretty sure it must be about triple the size that it was previously it's going to be a bit of a shock I think when we see it hopefully it's doing well and everything is okay and that it's managing to avoid this drama that is the male leopards of the northern Sabi sands at the moment good talking about sort of drama and things like that well Byron is sitting with the Inkuhuma pride and I wonder if there will be any drama this afternoon with the pride hunting well at the moment it doesn't look like it now I'm trying to make a decision here I think it might be worth us driving around a little bit and then coming back in about half an hour or so um, because there hasn't been much movement and possibly these lions are still just trying to rest And you can see that that wound on that lioness. It's, it's not looking bad, but it's still it's not ideal. That poor lioness. It's um, I, you know, I don't know. Actually, don't know what caused that wound. I would I would assume it was uh, from hunting something. I'm sure you can hear the wind at the moment and it's quite quite strong I don't know if it's going to rain this afternoon um, maybe this evening maybe this brings in a storm often if it is very windy it could just be very windy and not rain so I'm not sure but I was speaking about it earlier in bad weather like this or, or when it rains lions and leopards often do go out and hunt it's a little bit easier for them to hide masks their smell the sound everything so they can stalk up really close and hunt whatever it is they're looking for I think um, you know what I think I'm going to leave these lions I'm not going to sit here now for too long but I will come back a little bit later I just think that for the moment they seem uh, quite relaxed
very comfortable and possibly just trying to conserve some more energy until a little bit later so let's drive around a bit find I'm gonna check some clearings uh, you never know you could get quite a bit of general game in that area now especially because of all this wind but let's see what else we can find in the meantime I think rather that than sitting here with these sleeping lions for too long I hope all of you are having a wonderful weekend wherever you are in the world ours has been great actually ours has been lovely nice and relaxing today as I said I don't think our bird watching will be very good today because of this w wind um, oh wow Ellie's found something really small she wants to show you we did it's the smallest cutest little scrub here now it's it's about the size of the palm of my hand I, I would just assume and I don't want to get too close because it might start running away but I wonder why it is in the middle of the road you should go and hide in the bushes. A bird of prey is going to find you. There we go. <laughs> no, you have to carry on running. You didn't run far enough. And you're still on the road. Beautiful little thing. Now, during the day, likely they spend most of their day... They don't burrow like, like rabbits do. But rather, they go into very thick vegetation. Especially underneath thorny trees. Or thorny bushes where it might be harder for any potential predator to get to them. Why this little one has decided to be in the middle of the road on such a windy day when pretty much a lot of things can get it, I'm not too sure. Perhaps it got flush from where it was hiding due to something else walking around. But you're not in the safest place. Look at that fluffy little white tail running around. That was super cute. That was very special. <laughs> Paula, yes, that was super tiny. That was very, very cute. It was about the size of my hand, I would say. Without the ears, obviously, but about something like that. So, it's so cute. I wonder where it's gone off to now. Now, it's very thick in this general direction when, where it ran. So, I would assume that perhaps it's gone back to those bushes, back to where the yellow flowers are. That's a raisin bush. So, maybe it's hiding in there because it's quite bushy, very complicated to get in. If I were a little scrub here, that's probably where I would be hiding. That was a very cool little find. It's amazing how sometimes the wind confuses them and it brings out the best or some unexpected things onto the road. I'm hoping that this will be the day where we also get a pangolin and a caracal. They can all be in the same sighting. I will not complain if they all are. <laughs> but that was very sweet. Now, hares are mostly nocturnal animals, so the fact that we've seen it out and about during the day is also a bit of a strange thing. And this little one has got to be careful if it wants to have a good chance at, at making into adulthood, because it might not be the best thing to be out in the middle of the road during the day. Joy, its mother, it's probably somewhere else. They, uh, they develop quite quickly when they're little. So very likely its mother is just away doing its own thing. And they don't spend all their time with the little ones. When they're tiny, obviously the mother, and when they're about this big, the mothers will come and suckle them uh, a few times and then go and forage and so on. But I think this one is probably already on its own. Or if not on its own, at least it, the mother has gone in a certain direction and that one has been left behind as it would normally happen perhaps the mother is not too far away hiding somewhere else and this one was just being probably a naughty teenager and going out of the house before it should wants to party out in the wind now what are these tracks over here hmm. seems like i'm imagining things because there are no tracks on the road <laughs> maybe that was just wishful thinking should have actually stopped and looked at the tiny little scrub here tracks but I didn't think of it and talking about tracks and little things let's head back to Tristan who I believe is looking for leopards I am indeed looking for a spotted cat somewhere so far no signs or any tracks that will indicate 
that there is a spotted cat around but you can always live in hope I'm also just looking for anything else really I'm just kind of pottering about and I believe Ali was telling me today that she had tracks for a male lion somewhere around Philemon's cut line Rebecca's area and that the sticks have a random male lion lying with them now I'm not sure who the male lion is or what his story is but apparently the sticks seem completely unfazed by this male lion's um, presence and the other thing about it is that he apparently has got some really nasty fresh wounds that have been created now Ali told me that when she saw the tracks this morning that there was places where there was tracks for a male lion and blood drops on the road and so I wonder if the Birmingham's didn't get hold of him last night and that there's another male lion that's still sitting somewhere on Juma so just kind of wanting to try and see if I can find those tracks and just see how much blood was on them I think Ali said they were somewhere on Rebecca's so I might have missed them but let's just see how we go I'm going down towards Treehouse I know she said there was some tracks that came from Treehouse here they are here but they've been so driven over by vehicles it's going to be very difficult to make them out I'm pretty sure these are tracks also for the Inkuhuma pride so it seems as though maybe this male bumped into another male or maybe even the Inkuhuma pride who knows what's happened to him but apparently he's got some nasty cuts and scrapes on him now it's an interesting situation because I would have thought if it was a random male lion that the sticks didn't know given that they've got cubs and they're on a water buck kill that they would be less than friendly towards an intruding male and that they would try and chase him away as quick as possible but he seems to be just sitting there and they're not too f concerned about it he's just kind of sitting off to the side and everything is okay so I for a second thought well, I wonder if it's maybe not one of the sticks um, male lions that there used to be around this area when was it it was back in I can't even remember now 2015 was it 2014 2015 they were the two young six boys that were around and I wonder if it's not one of them there's I think the same male lion that was seen on on Kirkman's down in the south of the Sabi Sands recently. I actually have a photo of him somewhere. I'll try and find it. A very pretty looking lion. So I'll be a bit sad if he got beaten up because he looks really quite nice. And unfortunately though, this is the trials of being archer as a young male lion is that you've got many, many, many different coalitions to deal with. And it would be the first lion that's really come into this area since the Birmingham's have taken over and the first one that's probably been dealt with like by the Birmingham's properly but if it's this guy then it'll be interesting this is the one that was seen down on Kirkman's I'm not 100% sure if he's the same one that was seen with the sticks last night but maybe some of you out there that have an idea of who this lion could be will give you another photo of him there he is so there we go that's the photos of the guys from Kirkman's that they sent to us to try and ask. Now, Karen, you say that it could be the ginger matimba that could be with the sticks. Interesting. I, I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, I'll try and ask the guys if it's an older line. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. I know that the, the older male, well, the ginger um, member of the, of the matimbas has broken apart from Harry Belly, who's been left in the Kruger somewhere and very badly injured, and he's kind of moved on. But this line is a much younger individual that was seen, and this was taken three days ago down on southern Malamala, and so if that comes straight north, pretty much puts it right here. So I wonder if it's maybe the Matimba or it is um, this individual but if somebody saw photos and is the Matimba that'll be quite cool to know it, interesting that it's back in this area and surely not a good sign for that individual because I'm sure the Birmingham's will try and get hold of him if he is around here and like I say he's got some nasty cuts apparently on his forearms that are very fresh and bleeding and then apparently lots of flies on his back so maybe it is the Matimba I know they got into a fight recently um, I think towards the end of last year in just inside the Kruger with some other males and I think they both took a bit of a battering in that so it'll be just interesting to see how this all plays out and whether or not that Matimba makes another appearance on a live drive he was the two of them were such a big part of Safari Live when it first got back up and running in Juma and many of you will remember lots of very fun sightings of those two massive boys walking around here they really were impressive specimens both of them were incredibly large the, the track size of those two males was much bigger than what we see from these Birmingham's at the moment so always remember those two fondly and they certainly did a good job here for a while but it was just never gonna work two against five when the 
Birmingham's arrived. Now Trios Dam, not really much happening, still hasn't produced many leopard sightings this summer. It's interesting how winter Trios and Twin Dams were just absolute gold for leopards. Now in the summer it just goes to show that leopards do not use these dams nearly as much because there's really so much water everywhere that there's no point for them to come to a big dam and lie exposed like this. But in winter when there's no water they have to come here and they become hot spots for leopards. So nothing really much happening at Treehouse. So I think we'll carry on and see what else we can find. I see there's the impalas over here. Now from our impalas at Treehouse that are looking a bit petrified to go down to the water, let's send you across to Byron who's got some others that hopefully look a little calmer than these ones. Well it's very very windy but what I wanted to show you is exactly what I thought was going to happen. We're going to get to these clearings and we're going to see loads of animals or just impala <laughs> but animals out in the clearing and look how close all these impala are together. That whole herd is staying very, very close to one another because they know these conditions make it very difficult to listen out for predators or smell predators. So they'll stay a lot closer and be very, very aware of what is going on around them. But it makes sense for them to stay in the clearing. So they can keep a lookout for any potential danger. Sorry, Sins, let me just move forward. I just saw some other movement there. Uh, I think there's one or two warthog moving through there too. Can you see them? Just to the left of those impala and actually moving through. Yeah, there's one, two, look like three of them. And you see, also quite clever, staying close to the impala. If the impala alarm call, the warthog will be alerted that there's a predator around. hearing some Franklin's calling. I'm also going to listen out for any alarm calls, any sign of, uh, I don't know, an impala alarm call or anything like that, maybe a kudu bark. But interesting behavior and this is what I wanted to show you. It's amazing how all these animals know but these conditions and they need to stay close together and they need to be very, very aware. Wonderful to see those tails all swishing around, getting flies off of them number of little flies at the moment the bush is very green and especially after all the rain that we had they're all very very active now this is exactly the spot we had those wild dogs yesterday last night these wild dogs came and they lay down here exactly where those impala are it's amazing how one day you can have a predator and the next day prey in exactly the same position I wonder where those dogs went though. I think they ran north. I think the general consensus was that they ran north across our boundary into Buffles Hook and I think even all the way up into Manialeti. Which is not that far from here as a crow flies. So, Scarlett, um, you uh, you actually asked uh, just what I was explaining about the tails, and uh, you you're right. It is it is because of the flies. I mean, you saw. I, I'm not sure if you caught this morning's safari, but uh, we were on bushwalk. The amount of flies that were around us while we were walking it was quite unpleasant. So I know what those impala are going through. And shall we shall we continue? Let's see what else these clearings have in store for us. Gonna head a little bit further down.
funny how animals all take a bit of shelter in uh, in uh, weather like this. It's not very pleasant to be out. They know it, so they choose to hide rather than move around too much. Okay, let's head back over to Tristan. Um, I wonder where he is now, I'm not sure. I'm down on Weaver's Nest, Byron. We picked up the tracks for this mail line going sort of southwards towards Weaver's Nest and, and now heading south in this direction. So I just want to double check that there's no mail line lying somewhere here and it might be that same one that's maybe at Treehouse Dam on Little Gowrie because that's not too far. But what you can see is big, dark, ominous clouds that are being blown in at a rate of knots at the moment. They don't look ominous from a point of view that they look like a lot of water but they look like they're bringing a massive cold front and the air temperature is dropping by the second. It's starting to get quite chilly out here quite quickly. Now off on my left hand side there is a big bird sitting in a tree. So it looks like a pale form Wahlbergs. Yes, pale form Wahlbergs. So probably the one that nests close to twin dams and is being absolutely blown about all over the place. You can see how it's kind of leaning into the wind a little bit. So normally the Wahlbergs sit a lot more upright than that. But this one is having to sit quite horizontal and kind of duck its head a little bit to try and just balance itself. And see how much the tail is actually moving up and down in order to keep that bird balanced while it's sitting on top of that tree. It's getting blown about all over the place and feathers are being a bit windswept. And this cold wind that's coming in, I think, is a situation that's going to lead to a lot of birds of prey being down on the trees this afternoon. There's no thermals to be ridden and in wind like this, they're not really going to be effective in hunting. So I think we're going to find a lot of our birds of prey sitting on top of trees and taking it easy. Now what I want to do is just try and check <coughs> these male line tracks, see where they go and see what they got up to last night. Dale burrowing birds of Juma. Other than all of the birds in FC that burrow into their shukas and all kinds of other blankets when it gets cold, no, uh, there's no real burrowing individuals that go underground and spend a lot of time underground and, and then come out. So all of our birds pretty much are either tree nesters or they are individuals that will nest on the ground but not underground so they don't actually go into it. Now there's some disturbance on the road, I just can't see nicely, the light is so soft and there's so much wind that a lot of these tracks end up looking quite windswept. So I'm just trying to see what's going on. Yes, there's the male line track, so he's here, but there's no blood on this particular track at all that I can see. I'll try and just move a little bit so VM can get it on camera. But you can see what I'm talking about, how difficult tracking becomes in soft lights. Now VM, let me get out for you so I can show you exactly the track that I'm talking about. In fact, I've even lost it a little bit, but no, there it is. I can see it now. So, here we go. This is the track. Now I must try not to get around it. So there it is there. Now you've got the toes at the front here, like that. And then here is the back pad on that area. Now that is one track for this male line and he's going up the road and well down the road so I think it must be the same individual that we had well that is on Little Gari but let's just double check on the fire break maybe it's one of the Birmingham's that was tracking this male down it's interesting to have a little look but tracks are really tough to see they're not easy at all it almost just looks like a plain white surface at the moment so we'll try and kind of follow these and, and see what we get but I think these might have crossed south into Little Gauri already. So Samar, the reason we have less big male lions than lionesses is because if you had as many big male lions as you had lionesses on safari, you'd have a situation where there'd be just complete chaos all the time. The amount of females that would be around, there'd be so much fighting for those females um, to be able to mate with them that inevitably males get killed. And so that's why there's less of them, is that the competition over females is so much more as opposed to females fighting over females doesn't really happen. You know, you don't have a situation where females fight with each other unless it's two different prides, in which case they normally come together, fight a little bit and break apart. Whereas male lions will actively chase each other, will actively try and kill one another in order to bring those females back in or well, to be able to take over and dominate as well as they'll then go in and kill the young male cubs and they'll chase sub-adult males away and so that's why you only tend to see a lot 
uh, more lionesses than you do male lions. Also, lionesses can move around in a smaller section than what big male lions can. Big male lions will try and expand as far as they can and have big territories, whereas a lioness typically will try and have a much smaller area and, and be encompassed by a male that has multiple sort of females in his territory. So that's why you see less of them. Good. While we carry on and see where these lion tracks go, let's send you back across to Byron, who's got something that lions hunt every so often. Yeah, we do indeed. So, again, lots of antelope out in the clearings. Now, there must be one, two, three, four four five six seven eight nine at least nine or ten kudu that i can see in this area all standing very close together see how they're all facing different uh, different directions really interesting behavior and all to do with the weather see how animals change their normal behavior depending on on the weather and those females will be very careful and alert to protect those young uh, ca um, calves. All these, all these animals are looking. <laughs> Look at that little one. I wonder if some flies were biting it. <laughs> I'm just going to move forward slowly, just to get a better view of those quickly. Let's see, but they're all standing very close together. Now, usually, usually, I mean, you've seen kudu. They tend to move around. Oh, Tristan's managed to find a, find a chameleon. Let's go have a look quick. I'm the winner! Woohoo! So we had a bet who could find the first chameleon and well Vildi is actually the winner. He spotted the chameleon before me. So Vildi, let me try and go forward a little bit and see if we can get it a little bit better than the angle that we've got now. What a chameleon is doing walking around in weather like this, I'm not quite sure. Where did it go, Vim? It was right here somewhere. So I'm going to try and just get off and look and... Oh, here it is, right here, Vim. So it's coming out from... There it goes. So, hello little one. How cool is that color on that chameleon? It's got the most epic coloration because it's kind of probably out on the road. It was trying to just show itself to this big vehicle that was coming down. So it's got these browns and whites and electric greens. And it is really a very pretty female by the looks of things. It looks like a big female and actually looks as though she might be carrying eggs. Look how swollen her tummy is. You see how bulged that tummy is at the moment? And she's not flaring out to make herself big and puffy because you can't see the orange through throat so I think she might have little eggs inside there that she maybe might be wanting to lay but how cool is this little chameleon is the best thing now I know I get very excited about this but we haven't seen many chameleons you see look at how deep her body is at the moment I wonder if maybe there is some little ones inside there interesting but the coloration of this particular chameleon is absolutely phenomenal it is really super bright and kind of camouflage that it's trying to show is very cool where are you off to you must be careful now a chameleon out in the open like this is in a lot of danger there's a number of birds out here that go after chameleons so particularly things like the gray-headed bushrike they are very dangerous to chameleons they come out and they'll grab him and then a number of different snakes too so Wormslung, vine snake, mumbers, cobras they'll all go after a chameleon look it's just peering at us through the grass you see that they are the coolest things and they've got these incredible eyes where they are able to manipulate each eye individually from the other one. Now, Jeff, you say that's a first for you to see. Well, Jeff, I hope you're enjoying it because they are super cool little creatures and like I say, not something we get to see every day. So that's very cool and I didn't expect to see a chameleon at all in conditions like this. This is not really chameleon weather. We find them out in warm evenings, but that was super cool. So I'm glad we got to see it. And so while we carry on and see what else we can find and what other mysteries there are in the bush, let's send you back across to Byron and here's Kudu. Well, that's awesome. We haven't seen a chameleon in a long time, and we're hoping to spot them at night, but we haven't seen one, so it's the first one we've seen for ages. See, they're hiding in the long grass, I think. I'll watch these ox peckers and the kudu. Cleaning all the ticks off those ears. And they get right in there.
as I was saying, um, nice to see all these uh, these kudu together. I haven't seen a group this size for quite some time, but all very very cautious in the wind. I wonder what that kudu was chewing on there. It looked a little little hard but you see it swallowed whatever it was and at times because these kudus have these really long necks you can see when they regurgitate food again uh, being ruminants you can see that little food ball come back up and then they start chewing so let's let's actually see if this female does it again there do you see that exactly what I was speaking about yeah wonderful so then she just regurgitated that food again now she rechews it. That's why the, the the most of that, or actually all the antelope do it. They're obviously ruminants, very efficient digestive system. Re regurgitate what they fed on. It's mixed with um, some enzymes and um, and stomach uh, juices, and then that helps digest it even further. And then eventually they'll swallow it again. But it's broken it up a lot. And again, that was another one. Another one. See how full that cheek is, full of food. Ah, <laughs> uh, Mark, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I would, I would guess at times the ox peckers don't actually get the entire tick off the animal and maybe leave the head behind for those of you who don't know when you pull a tick off you've got to be very careful to get the the, the head of the tick out because often that head um, digs into your skin and and will sit there and when you pull the tick it breaks off and that can cause a bit of an infection now with the ox peckers I mean they comb so finely across the skin of these animals that I'm sure they usually get the whole tick but at times I think it's inevitable that uh, the head breaks off on the animal. And we saw a lot of ticks this morning on bushwalk. I haven't got itchy yet, but I'm waiting because there are a lot of pepper ticks around at the moment too. Not very pleasant. Now, I'm just listening to something. I can hear. You see all those kudu watching? Actually, if we just zoom out a little bit, Senzo, sorry. You see those kudu? Very focused. Okay. You know what? There's a the guinea fowl alarm calling. Now, let's see if I can maybe get through there. It sounds like it's quite far in the block, but guinea fowl definitely alarm calling at something. And all these kudu turned and faced that way immediately. I wonder if there is a gap to get through here. Look at all these kudu together. This is amazing. There's one impala. He's, he, he's clever, staying close to the kudu. Now I hope... Sorry, I just want to listen. Yeah, look, those guinea fowl are very unhappy. I'm going to go look in there quickly. Let's go across to Ali, um, find out where she is, and I'm going to try get in there and see if we can find what these guinea fowl are upset about. Well, it seems like Byron is normally lucky when guinea fowls are alarming around him, so I'm hoping that there will be something in that particular area. We are on our way to Chito, but we've bumped into a herd of elephants, so it's always wonderful to spend some time with them. Now, the ones that we're looking at are a little further away from where we are, but I just want to stand still because there are some on the bushes very close to us, and they might come out onto the road in the next few minutes or so. So I think it'll be worth it if we're patient, and then they'll just might pop out in here. Now, updates from Tingana, it seems that he's moved and he's no longer where we left him this morning. So I think we're still going to try and get uh, down onto that area, see if we can perhaps figure out where he's gone. And if not, then we'll just go around Chitwa, maybe we'll get lucky. Now, 
this is the particular elephant that we were talking about that's very close to the road but i think she's just taking she him hmm, we'll see now taking its time coming into the road there's a little one <laughs> hello almost there Elephants are also very alert in the wind. They don't particularly like it. And I would imagine for them it's even more annoying because with such big ears, the e the wind is probably oh, a bother more than anything else. Are, are you, do I need to move the car? I think maybe I am going to move the car slightly so that we get a bit of a view because it seems like elephants always act that they've like they've got all the time in the world. And, well, pretty sure that they do. So it's just, I think that if we go like this perhaps we'll be able to get a view of them without getting the poles of a roof in the way how's that for you Fern? does that work all right so it's the mother and the most recent offspring and it seems like there's one at the back as well so the last two offsprings that she's had are you guys eating the grass yes they're eating the grass at the bottom of the tree i thought perhaps they were interested oh I don't know if you can hear that, but there was a lot of rumbling. Jessica, uh, officially there are only two um, elephant species. There's the African elephant and the Asian elephant, but there's a lot of debate going on in the scientific and conservationist uh, communities because there's another species or a subspecies of elephant, as I want to consider it now, which is the forest elephant. Very similar to this particular elephant that we're looking at, very similar to the African elephant. They do live in the forest in Africa. They're just slightly smaller. Now, because they are completely separated from the normal elephants that we see or the savannah elephant that we see, a lot of people want to classify them as a completely different species because if they're classified as a completely different species, because there are so few of them, then automatically they will warrant a higher conservation um, what do you call it? protection. So there's a bit of debate. In theory, though, we only get this beautiful one that we're looking at and then the Asian ones. And the Asian ones are slightly different from the African ones. The Asian ones are a little bit more docile and smaller ears and more pigmentation around their face. Now we're going from giants to tiny ones and it seems like Tristan has got one of the smaller creatures of the bush. I do indeed. I have one of the cutest creatures which has now obviously disappeared because well, this is what happens. Whenever you want to show a creature off, it disappears. But there's its little tail sticking inside there. So that is a little tree squirrel that is kind of hidden inside of that area. Now there's another squirrel that's alarm calling just in front that I want to go and investigate quickly. It's, I suppose, whether that you could have things moving around. We've just seen a chameleon obviously move. So maybe a snake could be around. But I just want to double check... Ah, that's why there's a bird of prey right here. So is it a Batelier eagle? Yes, it is a Batelier eagle. Okay, okay, okay. You don't have to worry, it's a Batelier eagle. It's just, it's not going to hunt you. So the squirrel is going crazy because it's seen a bird of prey, but the reason why is because it just sees that shape and it thinks to itself probably this is drama. Can you hear it? There goes the eagle flying off. So this squirrel is probably petrified that anything with wings is going to be some sort of death that's going to come towards it. So that's why it makes all that noise. Now that it's flown away, all is quiet. Okay, we got your point. Thank you for showing us the Batsabir Eagle. Well done. How cool is that? <laughs> it's not every day you get to hear them. To do it once more for us. So that's what we always look for when we say squirrels are alarm calling. That's the sound that we're actually talking about, and it's a very cool sound. Now, I'm sure there's different frequencies, pitches, and tones depending on whether it's a bird or a leopard or a snake, but 
honestly, I don't know what the difference is between them. I find with leopards, they're far more insistent in, well, kind of repetitive and a lot quicker and a lot higher. But this is, I mean, it's difficult to say what they're actually looking at. So you always have to try and investigate it. And that's why we always follow up on alarm calls is you never know what you're going to get from a squirrel. Anyway, we're going to send you back across to those big animals that Ali is still with. And hopefully they will come out and have a really nice view of them. Well, they have and now it seems like they're going again. Now, unfortunately, they have crossed into a property that I cannot follow them. But at least for now, we've got a nice view of them heading into the bush. And you can see the branches are moving a little bit. So I think that's why they're not all that happy. Now, it sounded like there were some more elephants behind us. So I'm just going to go and explore. Perhaps we can see a few more elephants coming all the way from Chitwa Dam. And then we'll just delay or search for Tangana a little bit. Maybe he's actually at the dam himself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past him to go back to that spot. But there are a few spaces where I want to go check for him. But if there are more elephants down, down at the dam, that would be very nice to go and view them if they're drinking. Now I am hoping they'll be there. Ooh, lots of wind. Now it was funny because when we were sitting with those elephants earlier on, I don't know if you guys could hear the one female rumbling and she was quite aggressive about it and the little ones, instead of coming onto the road where she did, it's almost like they had to walk in the bush and then cross where the rest of the herd had crossed further ahead. It's almost like she said, no, you don't, this is not the road for you to cross. You need to do it further away. And then they went all the way and around. Would have been just fine for them been just fine for them to walk around it but clearly there was something that was unsettling her and she just felt that her youngsters had to do the route that the other ones had done now let's see hopefully there will be some elephants at the end of the road or at the end of the rainbow if we can find either the rainbow or the elephants <laughs> not too sure Perhaps they were calling from far away because with this wind, I wouldn't be surprised at noises that are being carried a little bit further if we are on the right end of the wind. Now, it doesn't seem for now that there are any elephants down at the dam. Uh, or maybe they are, I can't really see from here, but we're going to approach and go down there anyway, see what's lurking at Chutwa Dam this afternoon. Perhaps some bigger things, perhaps some smaller things, and we'll see what birds are braving the weather. Infinity game in some reserves do have fences in between them the the reserve that we're in now is part of the greater Kruger National Park which means that this reserve has got no fences to the eastern side with Kruger National Park now there is a fence on the western side because that's the limit of the natural or the protected area and the idea for that fence is to prevent animals from going into the local communities but it's just the most western boundary and we are, or the Sabi Sand is at the southern, almost the southern part, central part of the Kruger National Park. And then there's another massive reserve more towards the north, which is the Timbavati Glacier, which also form part of the Greater Kruger National Park. And there is a boundary in between the, the main roads and again, the human settlements, but there are no fences in between all the different smaller reserves that make up each one of these individual reserves. Now, Ferg, I think we have found all of the impala <laughs> right i'm gonna move across a little bit like this this is probably <gasps> and that's it that pardon sorry i got excited because there's a tiny tiny baby water buck right here is that fine okay sorry i'm still learning my way i'm gonna get my head out of the way because there's a tiny tiny baby water buck it seems like today is the day of the little things oh you are just the smallest water buck i've seen so incredibly cute this is a brand new one i haven't seen this one before and well this morning we spent a lot of time with a lot of water buck that were around here with some youngsters so what i think has been happening is this one has been hiding in the long grass the mother has probably not brought it down here before and now that it's a little bit older then this is why she's finally brought it onto this area I'm surprised there aren't any other water buck in just the male, but maybe they've gone somewhere foraging or they're somewhere at the under, other end of the open area. Whew, you can see it's not, it doesn't have its gray color just yet. It's still of a, of a tawny color, almost looks like a little impala. 
Yeah, Chris is saying it looks so fuzzy all the way from FC. And I agree with you. I feel like I, I want a baby water buck as a pet. It would be the best thing. Although it would probably kill Tristan because <laughs> baby water bugs carry a lot of ticks or just water buck in, in general. But that is the sweetest face. Look at that. And just in terms of heights, I would say that's what? 45 centimeters tall, Ferg? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Maybe a little bit more, 50? Yeah, I think about 50, so very small, probably the size of a medium to, yeah, medium sized dog, I would say. Oh, so cute. And it's already got its white ring around its rump. <laughs> a tiny little target. Maybe that's what we should call him. We should call him Target, just because this is a little one. Very cute. Jenny, a mini target, but you say, I agree with you, That's a, that we should call it mini target. It's very pretty, very, very pretty. Oh, I wish there were more, because then we would see what they get up to and how they play. Now, you see they're all surrounded by impala, and like I said earlier, I think we have found all of the impala in the Sabi Sand. They're probably in this massive open area. Now, it can go both ways sometimes with impala. They'll come into these areas because they can see far away and they are very protected over here, because there's no predator that's gonna be able to, to approach them without them noticing. But part of the issue is also that because there's a lot of wind, the temperature starts dropping, so they're going to start getting cold. So they might have to then retreat back into an area that's a little bit more sheltered just to be able to maintain certain body heat. Although they all seem to be eating the grass, so I'm sure that's going to help them metabolize and just keep a certain temperature. Hmm. You can hear the wind is howling. Ooh, that, is, that is the cutest little baby water buck. And all of the baby impala, they seem to have grown fairly fast. I've only seen a few every now and again that have that uh, that small baby look to them still. Most of them seem that they've gone onto the, the sub-adult face. Oh, so pretty. Hi, guys. All of you, eating. Tinti impala gestation period is about six months. Normally they mate around about in May and then they give birth somewhere around October, November. It depends on when they mate. If it's a little bit later than May, oh, there it goes running, then it'll, it'll change. But it's about six, seven months period, depending on the conditions. Sometimes if the conditions are not good and they're going through a very, or we're going through a very dry winter, then it might just take the fetus a little bit longer to develop. So might the gestation period might be prolonged for a few weeks you almost look like a little impala where's your mom oh, there's an impala going in between mom and the little one i think there's a little bit of panic mode yep <laughs> running the wrong way <laughs> uh, you're hiding amongst all of the impala you can almost pass for an impala yourself Seems like <laughs> someone's full of energy now. It's realized that it can chase all of the impala. It's almost like little kids when you take them to the park and they start running around chasing all the birds. I almost feel like that's what this little one is doing. It's realized that it can chase everyone away. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> now you're just being brave, aren't you? Terrifying everyone. All right. Do it again. One, two, three, go. Or maybe not. He's <laughs> having a standoff with an impala. And it's funny how his ears and how alert he already, or it already is, just looking around. And when it was a little bit scared, it just stood still, ears flapping all around, and then started running. <laughs> and it's looking very healthy as well. I think its mom has been able to feed well. So clearly she's producing very nutritious milk for this little one to be looking in such good condition. Very beautiful coat as well. You're a brand new one. Only a few weeks old. <laughs> Mini target. That is very cute. Smaller than an impala. <laughs> well, that's not going to be the case for longer. If you manage to make it to adulthood, you'll be quite big. Definitely bigger than an impala. Now it's fascinating that the color is so similar because as they grow older then it's going to start losing that coloration and it's going to become gray just like its mom was. And I don't know if its legs are starting to get that color already, if it perhaps been in the mud or in, in um, wet soil. 
and that's why it's looking that color now the male is very interested in this female he's picking up a lot of smells that she's putting down every time she's stopped to urinate he's been smelling her and i don't think it's for mating purposes perhaps because she's had the little one he's just trying to decipher what it is that's going on but i don't think she's well clearly she's just had this young one so she's not she won't be ready to mate until this one is weaned and sort of almost ready to to settle into adulthood very beautiful rumps cool breeze um impala and waterbug can eat the same plants um Waterbug tend to be a little bit picky about the grass that they eat, so it's it's a lot of studies suggest that they prefer grass that's very high in protein, and they've got to be around water a lot to just be able for the or they've got to drink a lot of water because of the type of grass that they eat. So they're often found around these areas, very close to water. Now impala, they're they're very adaptable creatures, so they can feed on on many different plants, and they'll, they're considered mixed feeders. They won't only eat the grass, but they will also eat the the leaves of the trees and fruits here and there. So I think it's a case of the impala can eat what the water bug eat, but just the water bug don't really eat what the impala can eat. If that makes sense, I know it sounds like a riddle, but I promise you, it makes a lot of sense. This is nice. Seems like Chitra Dam has been nice and sheltered. We're going to carry on exploring, see who else we can find down here, perhaps another baby. But while we do that, let's head back to Byron, who's rejoined the lions. I have, I have, and we have some heads up at the moment. So I'd followed up on those guinea fowl alarm call. There was a predator around, just not one with rosettes. It was a Wahlberg's eagle. Um, so those guinea fowl obviously would be nervous of the Wahlbergs. The Wahlbergs do, do catch and hunt birds. Um, and that's what it was. And as we got there, the Wahlbergs flew off. But, um, but it just shows you those guinea fowl, their alarm calls, when that, a whole group of them alarm call like that, there's definitely something there. It could be a bird of prey. It could be a snake. And it could also be a leopard. So that's why we went to go and have a look. But it was a Wahlberg's eagle. Anyway, I'm hoping that now we've come back, the temperature has dropped quite a bit. It feels quite chilly at the moment. So I'm hoping these lions decide to get a bit active and move around. But I'm not sure. Joan, so no, the lions don't purr. Um, and I don't think lions are able to purr. The only big cat that can purr and... That purring sound that we would uh, associate with cats. The only big cat that can do it is uh, is a cheetah. A cheetah do purr. But lions do not. Lions do not. Their voice box is slightly different. And I don't think they have the ability to purr. Too much of that cartilage and the bone in the throat that allows them to roar. Same with leopards. Leopards also do not. Oh, Ali's got a reptile heading into the water. Sorry, let me just go forward. We do, and it's going back into the water. No! Oh, almost there, almost there. Sorry, Ferg, that was my bad. Oh, we were trying to get a view of the crocodile heading back into the water because just as we saw it, it almost turned around and started heading back. And I think it's getting a little bit too cold for Vlad as well. So it's decided to go probably where it's warmer rather than stay out here in the cold breeze that's starting to come. Now we can still see its tail in its head. He's definitely standing still. And I wonder if it's perhaps there's a hippo not too far from him. Ooh, the wind is definitely howling now. It's such a long tail. Come on, do it again. All you have to do now is get out and then come back in and then we'll be very happy about it. It's amazing. This morning we came here and we couldn't find traces of him, or at least I couldn't find him, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was just on the back part of the island because we didn't check here this morning. Mm, look at those teeth, so white and clean. It looks quite menacing when the teeth are exposed like that. I wouldn't really try and make my way towards 
any sort of um, crocodile and it's funny because where I come from we have also I'm originally from South America and there we have so many different species of crocodiles and caimans and they're not as grumpy as the Nile crocodiles I should say they're very the Nile crocodiles have a reputation of being a lot more ferocious and, and aggressive than perhaps some of the ones that we get where I'm from and in those areas even you can have a dam like this and get in the water with them and they will pretty much not do anything to you unless we're you know if it's a caiman if it's a bigger species they might have a bit of an issue but you can swim very close to them and they won't attack them whereas here in South Africa I would never ever dreamed of <laughs> coming close to any sort of water body where there are hippos or crocodiles involved now I want to check if that in front of us no that is a rock not a hippo okay I thought it was worth checking <laughs> But no, sorry, that was all me. Now let's see who else is around here. Lots of hippos, they don't seem to be all that playful today. Hello, bushbuck. How are you guys doing today? Uh, I thought they were baby. Uh, baby waterbuck. Well, they could have been. They're, <laughs> they're about the right color, <laughs> Ferg. <laughs> no, I think the rest of the waterbuck that we saw this morning are actually on the other side of the, of the dam. But those are so we've got the water buck on the right with the ring around its drum, the bush buck, the ones on the left, and then the birds on the left, those are the blacksmith plovers. And then what is the other one? Let me see properly with my binoculars. I can't really tell what it is. Hang on, mm, I think it's just out of reach for my binoculars, but it looks like yep, like a white faced whistling duck, perhaps. Some of my favorite ducks all around. <laughs> now, um, where should we go? I think we're gonna see if maybe we can find the goslings again, the the Egyptian geese goslings. But while we do that, let's head back to Byron, and I hope that it's not as windy there as it is here. Yeah. It's definitely. I I don't think it's as windy as it is there. I know what. Uh, to a dam is like. Oh, man, we've got some yawns, so there's a bit of activity stretching, cleaning, grooming one another. So, they might we might be lucky, and these lions might decide to get up. I do, however, hope that they walk this way. I'll tell you why is because if they go away from us, that bush is so thick, we won't be able to follow them through there. I can tell you that now. Um, it would be extremely difficult. We'll have to drive around and wait on the other side and hopefully they, they come through. I was laughing at um, Ellie saying she'd love to have a, was it a water buck? Yeah, a young water buck. But Tristan would get upset. <laughs> With all the ticks, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> Couple goals in the bush, finding a pet that you both <laughs> both are comfortable with. <laughs> 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 well, it's very difficult to have pets out here. Not a good idea. I was just thinking about Chitra, Chitra Dam, and um, I, I haven't been there yet on this, no, I've driven past, but I haven't spent time there, so maybe tomorrow I'm going to ask if I may be allowed to go to Chitra. Have a look at this one on the left. Yeah. Cool breeze. Um, the lions. You know what? I, to be honest, I don't know how they decide it's time to go. It's just when they feel comfortable, when they feel like they've rested enough, when they feel like it's cool enough that they don't um, exert too much energy. Then they'll they'll get up and move. I just want to 
try and maneuver off to the side here quickly. Hold on a second. Sorry, Sims, I just want to um, try to get a view of these playful lions. But while I do that, um, Ali seems to have found uh, those goslings at Chitra Dam. Let's go have a look. Sorry, Byron, we were with the goslings, but then something else caught our eye, and it's this Nyala that are on the other side. This, They were doing their sideways display, and it's normally a way for them to resolve any sort of issue when it comes to hierarchy, especially if there are females that are ready to mate that are involved in the process. Now, it seems like the wind is bothering a lot of the animals as they stand still and carry on listening. And of course, now they've stopped doing their display as they were a few minutes ago. I am hoping they're going to go back to it because it's very interesting. I think I can hear some guinea fowl alarming in the distance, but it's very hard to tell with the wind. Now, there we go. You see that Daniela are roughly raising their, he their hair. <laughs> they're called pilar erection. And although I think the wind is not really helping them all that much, what they do is they tend to approach one another sideways. And I think... This is not as aggressive as it should have been and perhaps it's the wind that's actually confusing me. But when they do raise their head like that, what they do is they'll go and stand next to one another to try and make themselves look bigger than what they really are. And the whole idea of raising their heads and doing this display is almost like when the elephants go and they open their ears and raise their heads is to make themselves appear bigger than what they really are to try and um, intimidate the opponent and not having to get into a fight. So that way everybody knows who's who and you don't really have to fight for it. It's already decided just by looking at each other. Now there's a random female in the middle, so I wonder if she's perhaps the reason for all of this for all of this males being around. Because Niala, yes, they can be sometimes found in the close proximity, but we, these are a lot of males. One, two, three, four, five, six males in the same area, then there's definitely someone that's perhaps ready to mate that's attracted all these males and that's why they're all here. And you see they're all keeping their distance and it's funny because they're they've just left this female in the middle. She could be the one that's potentially ready to mate, or if not, there are quite a few other females around, so I wouldn't be surprised if this one just sort of happened to catch herself in the middle of all of them. Hmm. Very beautiful. Now, I think uh, let's maybe let's go back to the goslings because they were looking a lot prettier and I think maybe they're just gonna have to start moving now I apologize for the wind and maybe if the sound is coming a little bit funny we've got four goslings still I'm happy to report it doesn't seem like we've lost any of them in the last few days which is always a success probably means that Hosanna hasn't been around here trying to eat any one of them <laughs> but they're all looking they're all looking good and they're looking bigger and still they've got that beautiful killer whale look to the back of them now these were the ones that we were looking at earlier on when Byron linked to us and they are all very fluffy and I think they're also lying very close to each other because they're probably very cold. Yeah, it's almost like they were standing on top of one another. Very cold little things. So to try and keep warm, that's often what they do. A lot of the birds, they just require on body heat or the warmth that is irradiated by each one of them to keep warm. We've got the two little ones that are, have gone onto the water, perhaps the braver ones, and then the other two that seem to be the bigger ones at the back. Did you just fall while scratching your wing? <laughs> I think that's exactly what happened. Yeah, um, I don't think this would be the pet that I would want, though. I feel like I'm not in it to have pets. Now, all the Impala are running on the damn wall. And I don't know if it's just because of the wind or if it's because there's something else that's running behind them. Earlier on the guinea fowl were alarming, but it could have just been anything else. It could be nothing. It could be just the wind spooking them. But they're all running back into the open area. Paula, some antelope can swim. Um, the water buck are very good at it. That's part of the reason why they're called water buck. They, they're always found close to the water. But the impala can also swim, if, especially if wild dogs are behind them. I've seen them often. That, that I've seen them often go into the middle of the dam and try to get out of the reach of the of the wild dogs because the wild dogs will not get them in the water. So. 
different different antelopes are more adapted to more aquatic environment the puku for example or the lechwe in botswana are more adapted to this type of life so that you can all you can see them more often than not in the water but just to go in the water for a swim and to have fun no the water is more a, a, a means to an end you are so cute but you guys are on the wrong side of the open area everybody's on the other side so that's perhaps where you should go so that you're protected with the rest of your group Tingana is not perhaps somewhere around here and that's why they're all getting so spooked and running around hmm. <coughs> so cute you've got to run a little bit faster to keep up with your mom now the open area is a very good place for them to be as I said earlier they can see anything coming from quite a distance but I think there, in, in this particular time, I don't think there's anything specific that's lurking in, in, the, in the darkness or in between the bushes. I think it's just they can't hear very well. Probably a lot of smells are being taken away. And they just have to be a little bit more on edge just to make sure that they don't get caught unaware and then something pounces on them. Because obviously that would be, or probably would be the end of it. I think maybe we're going to go and explore in the direction where the water bug are facing. Let's see if... Let's see if maybe some of the if Tingana is around there, if there are any tracks for him. But while we reposition and go all the way there, let's head back to Byron as it seems like the lions are starting to wake up. Well, there is, has been a bit of movement. And um, these lions are still cleaning one another, but heads are up. So far more movement than we found, when we found them earlier on drive. But it is still, it, you know what, the best way to describe the weather is it is a bit miserable at the moment. Um, there's no other way to describe it. It's wonderful and cool, which I'm really enjoying the cool weather from the heat that we had yesterday. And uh, But, but the, the wind and that does make it a bit miserable. And I think this is hot chocolate and safari live weather maybe maybe i'm going to head back to camp and then i'll watch tristan and ellie for the rest of the drive while i have some hot chocolate <laughs> mm. what do you think senza yeah. mm. <laughs> big boss man tristan apparently gave Cursed a BDI, uh, gave cursed a BDI and uh, shook his head. <laughs> so that's a no no. <laughs> I wonder if Tristan's going to give me a disciplinary after this. Um. <laughs> ah, there's a little bit of playfulness on the left, Senza. Have a look. Yeah, see these young lines. Oh, there we go. <laughs> as soon as one gets bitten then there's no more playfulness young lions are always really great to watch because they do get very playful and they ah oh, look at that nice stretching and jump on one another especially when the pride starts to move and they get quite active So quiet. There are a few birds calling in the distance. Cape turtle dove. Um, sounded like perhaps a scrub robin. A 
So there are a few birds calling. Not seeing too many of them. I think they, they're holding on tightly in this wind. Probably well hidden. Heard some aromark babblers earlier too. So the birds are out. I did see that little cub, um, but it was it's hidden from us at the moment. It's lying a little bit further to the left with another lioness um, through basically through that tree through the back there. That's why I said I don't think you'll see it, but it's in there somewhere. Um, let me see a bit there. I don't know. Don't worry about it, Senzo. We'll wait and see if um, or, or when they start moving. Hopefully, get to see them. All right, well, it's that time where we need to go back to Tristan and find out what he's actually been doing and where he is. Oh, Byron, I've been sitting in FC having a hot chocolate. I thought you that's what we were going to do. You told me you were going to come and join me, but you never arrived. So I've done that. Now I'm just getting back out again just to go and see what's going on. But what I want to show you guys, I just had a thought quickly. It's going to take me a little bit of time to get there. You'll see me reversing because I want to go and show you something very cool. But we've in, in the meantime, while we kind of get there, I'll tell you what I've been up to really because I haven't been in FC having hot chocolates, even though it sounds like a fantastic idea, Byron. I've been driving around looking for Tandy and so far absolutely no sign. No sign of really anything actually. No birds, no sort of insects just wind that's all we've had so far and it's been pretty miserable at the moment now, I believe there's lots of rain to the south of us around Johannesburg area so I wonder if maybe that's going to come up this way at some point right you might be wondering why am I driving here what is you what am I up to well I'll show you fairly shortly just give me two seconds to get in here quickly and so that I can show you exactly what I mean now, there we go, Vildi, is that close enough? So, I wanted to show you guys what happens when male lions versus leopards climb trees and how different it looks when a male lion goes onto a tree. Now, normally what we'll find is when a leopard goes onto a tree, you'll find little claw marks like these. So, if you have a look where my finger is, Vildi, there's little slices like this, and this is probably from where Tandy dug in and she took a carcass up a tree. We know that then Tinyo came along and he went up this tree, and you can see the difference between his claws. Look at how deep that is etched into the wood. It's gone right in. I can almost put a, my pretty much my finger inside there. And so that's his claws, and it gives you an idea of also just how wide his claws are. Here's the other one over here. So it would be something along that sort of lines that's how wide his paw would have been as he tried to grab and go up and you can actually see them all the way up as he fought his way trying to get through long big deep gouges into this marula tree now it's something that you don't see very often and if you came across here somebody would probably think that wolverine had been around but it's not wolverine from the x-men this is a tinio from the birmingham mail coalition that went all the way up there to go and fetch those two different kills that tandy had in this tree over a month ago so just pretty insane to kind of see the depth and the size of these paws when they're on the tree and you see leopards kind of markings and they're always quite small and you can see it quite clearly but just to see the width in these is just absolutely phenomenal it's an amazing thing i can show you just with my hand these are the claw marks over here and that's just the size of my hand in comparison so his paws are bigger than my hand basically which is pretty insane and you can actually see where he slipped here and his claws kind of came down and he moved and he battled his way up into the tree as we know he almost fell a few times so thought it would be just a cool thing we were right here we might as well have gone into it and had a little look and shown you all what it looks like when lions climb marula trees the poor marula tree suffers a little bit but the lion himself did quite well i think tenyo did a sterling effort to get up into that tree to see that right now i'm gonna try and find an animal of sorts and maybe even 
the very leopardess that had the kill in the tree and while I do that I believe Ali has spotted something so let's quickly go across to her We have spotted a good old friend, Tristan. This is indeed Tingana. Now, he is not too far away from Chitwa Dam, funny enough, and I think he's being very clever. There are so many impala around here. This is probably the best spot for him to start hunting this afternoon. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if he's done this on purpose. He's walked a certain distance from where he was. He was probably at the top part of the Molowanini on the Chita property. Now, he's gone pretty much towards the end. So, all in all, I would say maybe about 1K, 2K is at max. But he's now found another comfortable bush where to sleep in. And it is very cold, so I'm sure he's chosen that spot for shelter. And as the sun starts to go down, or as it gets darker, because it's already quite dark, he might try and head in the direction of all the impala and the water buck and Egyptian geese and all the different creatures that are at the moment seeking shelter in the open area. Very clever of you, Tingana. You know exactly where to go. And he's probably he's still a little bit weak. It's probably the reason why he's been hanging around a certain area and hasn't covered much of his territory. I'm sure he's just waiting to gain force again or recuperate a little bit from his illness so that he can then try and start moving around. He seems to be on the men and I mean his stomach seems to be a little bit fuller than the last time I saw him which was a few days ago. He seems to be doing a little bit better. He's still a bit on the skinny side but it seems he's on the men, which I'm very excited about because I've come to really enjoy Tingana's company all the way from last minute leopard to <laughs> being the boy that features in the most. So I'm hoping that he's going to do well tonight. The, the stars are almost aligning for him with big storm approaching, lots of wind, so he all he has to do is just be very careful of how he approaches all the different creatures around and he might get lucky. Infinity Gaming, you're wondering how we can identify which leopard it is. Well, normally there are a few ways of trying to identify the leopards. Um, you can look at their spot whisker pattern, so the spots on top, oh, well, they're just on top of their whiskers, and that they're different for every leopard. So they'll have maybe four on one side, five on the other side, and if you can see the whole face, and you can just get an idea of the side profile. Now, in this particular case, we know that it's him because it's not too far from where we saw him in the morning, but also we saw him get up and then move around and then go back into the bushes. So the more we tend to spend time with some of the leopards, the easier it becomes to identify some of them. You can almost tell straight away and it's like, okay, I think it's this one. And if there's oh, any doubt, then you can always use their spot pattern to be 100% sure which individual you're looking at. On this particular case, I think more than by looking at whiskers or anything else, we've gone by location where he was a morning where he is now. And when he got up, he's got this, this look, he's got a face. <laughs> so it's easy to recognize. If you, I don't know how to explain it, but if you imagine a lot of people, you won't be able to tell their faces apart at first if they all look roughly the same. But the more you look at them, the easier you, it becomes for you to start memorizing their features. Hey boy looking a little bit tired aren't you <laughs> well he's got a good spot underneath this bush willow seems like a bush willow to me and he's lying in full <laughs> in, in a very leopard spreaded way <laughs> It's almost like, you know, he's butter on a toast or something. <laughs> That's the way he spread. And it would be very hard to see him coming from the other way. We just wanted, we came onto this edge because we just wanted to check. There was a possibility of him moving not too far and we just got lucky in the fact that he was here. Which is very good and w because we're very happy because now we can see him and enjoy him for the afternoon. Which is more than what we had planned on. Was I thought he might have stayed in the area where he was in this morning, but when I heard he had moved, the possibilities of places where he could have been were pretty endless. So I think luck has been on our side a little bit, and there's always that wonderful gut feeling <laughs> that sometimes tells you to turn in the right direction. And I think that's partly what led Ferg and I onto this particular spot today. I think that was it, wasn't it? Now he's sleepy, and you can see the wind is still howling. Mm, beautiful. Now it seems like Byron is still with the lions and I'm hoping they're a little bit more active than the leopard. Well, there is a bit of movement, Ellie, there is a bit. 
I'm glad you got to see Tingana again. So I'm assuming he's in the same place he was this morning. And, um, but, you know, these lines, there's, every now and then one of them will stand up and move around and then lay down and then another one will do the same. So not a lot of movement, but, uh, but their heads are, they're definitely more active than the pride we saw yesterday. Oh, and I'm so, hold on, hold on, sense. let me try this quickly, sorry. I'll tell you why, because the, the little cub is hiding in here, but there seems to be a lot of activity from them just through here. Maybe we can get a view if I go over here. Senzo, is that alright? Can you get them through there? Let's see, let's see. Maybe we can show you a little bit of the activity from here, some of the sub-adults. But the, the little cub is is in there. Just to the left, it's hiding there. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Very cute. Now, earlier, one of these sub adults walked up to the cub and they were having a bit of a standoff. Steve, um, <clears throat> so there, there are animals that obviously carry diseases out uh, um, in the in the wild, um, not like mad cow, but um, oh, let's see, maybe this youngster climbs into the tree, this dead tree. Sometimes they do do that; they get a bit curious and active. Um, Steve, so th these lions last year they had. Uh, a disease called white muscle disease and they got that from a food deficiency they weren't getting I don't think they were getting enough fat and the nutrients that they need from their food so it causes the muscles to to stiffen up and and can cause the lions to die but they managed to get through it okay um, and then uh, they, they they can sometimes get um, uh, mange, so mange can occur in some of these animals, also with drought and that. Um, what else? Wild dogs get canine distemper. They sometimes pick up from, uh, well, we don't really know how they pick it up at times. Occasionally, well, the most um, plausible cause is getting in contact with uh, feral dogs. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, what else, um, the buffalo, the Cape buffalo that we have in this area, they get a bovine tuberculosis at times, but that's also from being in contact with with local cattle and that, so that can spread quite easily, but, but you know, generally the animals are healthy and those diseases can kind of come and go or only affects them when they get, get much older and they are weak, then the chances are, are probably higher that that disease is going to affect them and they're going to die from it but generally the animals are healthy there is a little cub playing with well I think he's being picked on he or she's being picked on at the moment Is very peaceful sitting watching the lions. <laughs> well, I'm still going to sit and wait. I think it might be worth our while. I'm hoping so. But let's go back to Ali with that male leopard and see what Tingana is up to. Right, Tingana has not moved all that much if at all whatsoever 
but we're gonna keep guard here just in case he does decide to get up and start moving it'll be nice to see him approach all of this area and I'll be quite curious to see if he is going to try the open area and all the different prey species that are lurking in there if he perhaps is going to try go somewhere else and try his luck in an area that's a little bit more sheltered where he can bump into you perhaps something smaller like a diker or a steambook or perhaps a lonely impala that's looking for some warmth out in the out in the bush hmm. you've had a very deep sleep and i don't blame you on a sunday like today hmm. Jessica, leopards are considered mostly solitary creatures, so unless you see a mother and a cub or perhaps young siblings together, um, it's very rare to see more than one leopard together. So it's very pointy details in, during their lifetime when they will actually spend some time with some other leopards. Um, they don't hunt together. They have seen, and funny enough, um, GDH was sen sent me a video yesterday that I still haven't been able to see of two young male leopards sharing a kill. When they were still old enough not to have to share a kill, they didn't hunt it together, but there was a little bit, uh, apparently, of violence in between the two of them. But because they were siblings and they almost forcibly shared the kill. Now this particular male that we're seeing, he seems to be quite sociable with his offspring as well and not too long ago we had a case where he was allowing two of his sons that are not directly related to one another, allowing them to to share a kill with him. These were Hosanna and Tamba. Now it doesn't happen all that often but I find it interesting that it dep when you talk about animals it depends of what area you're talking about because now a lot of the leopards have been studied in different parks different reserves perhaps in areas where there isn't a high uh, such as high density as there is here in the savvy sand which is considered one of the areas with the most leopard density in the world so in this particular spot perhaps because there are too many of them they seem to be more sociable or be more tolerant of other leopards than perhaps leopards in other areas which always proves that there's um, an exception to every rule and you've got to take a lot of factors into consideration and every time that you think there's a rule there might be someone that just <laughs> shows you that you're entirely wrong but in general terms no leopards do not hunt together and they do not share kill unless it's a mother and a young one or unless in some sort of situation where it's leopards that are somehow related but I, that, that would be as far as I would stretch it I've never seen leopards hunt together the same way as um, lions do for example You are completely asleep. Although there is your eyes open, so you are well aware that there's a lot going on. His ears are not that alert, so I think he's just trying to block the wind out. And it almost seemed when he got and lay down in this spot that he was trying to get underneath all that foliage and just trying to get and squeeze in as much as possible. But <laughs> I think perhaps the branches are too low for him to try and do that. The spot where he was in in the morning was a lot better for that. Oh, it seems like the other cats, who funny enough also have some spots, are kind of playing, so let's head over to them. Yeah, we've got a little bit of uh, bit of activity here. Uh, that little cub, isn't that cute? I'm picking up little sticks and 